you know, for people out there who are considering, you know, what's the next stage of my professional development? Well, don't go on a backstroke CPD or a freestyle turn CPD. Find find something that's going to allow you to be a better person in the way that you deliver. Because I honestly believe that great coaching is not the content, it's the delivery. Welcome to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast, where we aim to give swimming the coverage and publicity it deserves. Every week, we celebrate the sport we love with amazing special guests and topics from around the swimming pool. And now, here are your hosts, Scott and Dan. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Propulsion Swimming Podcast. Dan, no messing around this week. We are going to get straight into this podcast, and we have a belter of a guest for you all. Mm, We've got one of the most well-known coaches in both the UK and in Ireland, and I feel like there might be a little bit of brain picking from us on this one, so it could be a long one. I'm very much looking forward to it, though. Yes, me too. So for this week's episode, we've got Olympic gold medal and world record setting swim coach, Ireland's National Performance Director of Swimming and Diving, the newly appointed president of the World Swimming Coaches Association and one of the most recognisable men on the British poolside. Please welcome John Rudd. John, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. How are things with you? Yeah, they're great, gents. And um that was a hell of an intro. Thank you very much. Um, I hope I don't let you down after bigging me up so much there. <laughs> no, it's very much deserved. We've, um, I tell you what, both me and Dan have been racing against Plymouth for, well, we raced our whole swimming careers against the squad that you put together down there. So we are, mm. we're very excited to touch upon that topic. But first, a massive congratulations on becoming president of the World Swimming Coaches Association. You must be chuffed. I am. I mean, it's... <sighs> Look, it's a great honour and um, there's very few coaches that are going to have that privilege to try and help the sport that they love make progress, particularly in the coaching world. But, um, you know, it comes with a little bit of trepidation because I step into some really quite remarkable shoes in terms of George Block, the previous president, and what, what he achieved during his time. And I've also got to balance that with, you know, my day to day work of trying to improve swimming in in uh, in the nation that I work for. So um, I hope I've not bitten off more than I can chew, but I've always loved a challenge. And um, the one thing that I've always lived by is if you're going to do something, then you do it properly. So they won't get anything other than 100% effort and commitment out of me. And we'll see, we'll see where we go, particularly as swimming is in such a, an exciting time, you know, flux and change around FINA and LEN and so are them many bits and pieces that I couldn't have picked a, a less quiet time to take it on, you might say. <laughs> so what does it mean to be president? What kind of roles and responsibilities are there? Well, I'm still unpicking that, but I, I was vice president for um, four years. So I, I got to see uh, George do do his thing as president prior to this. And um, I've been a member of the board Initially, as the British Swimming Coaches Association uh, representative when I was the chair of of the BSCA a number of years back. So I've got experience of what they they hope to do and what they're trying to do. And it's been very, very much kind of slowly, slowly catchy monkey in terms of, um, you know, unpicking and trying to rebuild what what might be right in the the world of swimming is is no small task, right? So... um, Ultimately, if you were to if you were to put it into two areas, <clears throat> there's less than one percent of coaches in the world that work at that world level. Um, so, although it's a relatively small group, it's an important group because they have a great deal of influence, or should have a great deal of influence on the way that the sport is uh, managed and the way that the sport evolves. So, we'd advocate for that group of coaches and um, advocate for them a voice at the at the tables that make decisions around the, the the really important stuff that matters, you know, how the Olympics operate, how the world championships operate, um, where the world juniors sit in the calendar and all of that kind of thing. Mm. And then then there's ninety nine point something percent of coaches that don't work at that level. And it's close to a majority of them don't have international coaching representation and don't have formal coaching qualifications 
So there's a lot of nations out there where coaches are literally just flying by the seat of the pants every day and doing what they think is right, reading books and doing their own bits of research on the net and trying to do best by athletes in relatively poor facilities in countries that you wouldn't consider to be anything like big hitters in the world of our sport. But when you look at how many of those coaches there are and then percolate that down to how many athletes they have an influence on and over, it's a huge amount of our sport out there that those guys need support with representation, uh, with informal and formal education. And that's where Wuska can, can help too. So we're, we're looking to establish the cake. And then we're also looking to really work on that cherry on top of the cake as well. Oh, that's a great analogy to kind of finish that explanation. Yeah. Um, that's, that's not a small job in the slightest. How, how are you going to juggle that with Swim Island? Is there like a massive support team behind the scenes at the World Swimming Coaches Association? So um, the World Swimming Coaches Association has evolved in the last couple of years in that we've we, strategically we've decided that it should operate in continental bodies um, that report to the, the board, you know, the, the, the main body of, of the association, if you like. And we started that just before COVID with um, the establishment of a, the European branch, Wuska Europe. And we were at the European Championships in Glasgow in 2018. And we had 50 or 60 coaches from, I think it was 22 or 23 different nations sat in a room in Glasgow, all agreed that we should do this, put a draft constitution to them. We took a big list of names of all of those guys that were, were keen to help. And then COVID hit. And, um, and, and then it, that's kind of stumbled, and we've really got to pick that up now. But with international travel being difficult, um, and coaches having much more on their plates to deal with, of you know, it used to be like if I go to an international swim meet, how fast do my athletes swim? At the moment, if you go to an international swim meet, it's how fast do my athletes swim, despite the limitations they've had? Are they going to be safe and well by the end of the meet, and can I actually get them home? Right, so the whole sort of gambit of what an international swim meet is has drastically changed, and Tokyo very much underlined that, and so did the recent World Short Course in Abu Dhabi. That you, you know, that I can't remember, but I can. But it's a long time ago that you just went to a swim meet with your with your national team, and it was how quick are we, and can we win medals? It's it's been a lot bigger than that for a long time, and it maybe will be for again for a few more months. But the moment we can get past this, and you would hope that we're relatively soon when you look at how COVID is around the world and the new variant and so on, that, you know, fingers crossed we're coming towards the end of end of this, that that'll get rebuilt. And then that'll be used as a template then for the other continents around the world to do something similar. And then each board, each continent will have a, a representative body and their own board, if you like, that's, that's made of coaches from within their continent that really care about seeing their sport move forwards. And then the Whisker board as a whole will be the glue between the bricks that brings all of that information together and gives advice and so on. Because for, for Whisker to just to sit in one room and go, let's sort out world swimming, that, that's not going to happen. It needs to be broken down mm. into manageable constituent parts. So we that that's the plan. Um, but COVID, as with so many things, has it, it didn't kind of put the brakes on it, but it but it yeah, it certainly slowed it down in in some respects. So there's a lot there's there's a lot of coaches out there that are desperate to do good by the sport, uh, and they're to be found in every continent. And that's that's what we intend to do. Between now and Paris, and maybe a little bit longer, we'll start to build up those continental bodies, and then we'll see what kind of influence we can start have on. You know, those things that make up world swimming, like LEN, like the Pan Ams, like the Pan Packs, like the Asian Games, all of that kind of stuff. That's, yeah, sounds simple, doesn't it? But that's that's what it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's almost like, um, it's kind of like professionalizing the sport almost at the coach's level, if that makes sense. Well, look, at, I would argue that that every coach that really cares about what they're doing is is already a professional. It just might not be with a capital P. You know, as long as they're planning well and doing the best part of the athletes, they're a professional. Yeah. And whether they're getting paid or not is a different matter. Um, <clears throat> but 
what we are certain of um, is that the coach voice um, outside of the national governing body. So when you get beyond the national governing body, the coach voice has, has not been heard as I think as much as it should have been in terms of what the sport should look like. And ultimately the coaches form the majority of the professionals in the sport around the world. Mm. Um, you know, they, they've, they've done qualifications and it's their vocation and, and, and then, and they need to be listened to, even if they listen to, and then they're told, no, we don't think that's right. Well, that's something, uh, but mm. they need to be, they need to be listened to and they need to bring their voice to the table that, that will help the sport make its steps forwards. So um, I know what you're saying about professionalize. Um, I would suggest it's in, it's ensuring that one of the key stakeholders or group of stakeholders within the sport is given a seat at the table and they're, they're able to say, you know, we've been doing this collectively for goodness knows how long. Uh, we know what it takes to uh, move this sport forwards. Um, please at least give us a chance to tell you what we think before you go make a decision about what you do next. Mm. Mm. I mean, how can coaches get involved? How can they have their say? Well, the great news is that the World Swimming Coaches Association is a free body to to join at the um, at the sort of foundation tier, if you like, is free. It's just a case of going on to wscacoach.org, dropping your email into a registration box, and you're a member. Um, and that then you start getting all sorts of information, invites to education sessions, uh, you get some newsletters and all sorts of really good bits and pieces. And the the capture um, for that now is is in the hundreds of thousands. So that's great news. Oh, good. Um, then there's a um, an accentuated level, if you like, where you can pay something like ten dollars or it, it's something really small um, per month, and you get an amplified service, more information more opportunity to engage with with world leaders in their fields and so on. And we've got some exciting plans coming up about how we'll work with some bodies that maybe you don't even know exist. You know, there are some bodies out there that have responsibility for open water swimming. Um, it's certainly outside of the competitive element of open water swimming. And they literally have hundreds and thousands of coaches working with them, but wouldn't have a direct um, association or affiliation with with national governing bodies or with or with FINA or with LEN. We need to find a way to bring these people together and get them get them all talking um, rather than working in silos, even though in some cases they're big silos. Um, and so that's it. You, you go to the website and you either choose the free package or the relatively small cost package and, and you're away. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's a fantastic initiative. We'll, we'll drop the link for that in the description of this podcast. Um, plenty for you to look forward to in the future john you're, you're going to be a very busy man but if you don't mind let, let's rewind slightly let, let's look back at plymouth so l- like me and dan said we we raced in the southwest constantly um you had a great c- career at plymouth leander what were your highlights there um well it, it's difficult to say what what the highlights were because there was there was so much success i think in that program for quite a lot of time. And I would absolutely say that I was a, I was a, the leadership of a great team rather than, you know, it was, it was John Rudd's thing. I had so many talented and great coaches and people that worked with me and for me at the time that, it's, you know, they, they might give you different answers. But look, Plymouth produced an Olympic champion, which that's... And at a time when Britain wasn't doing that, you know, after Tokyo, it, it does seem that that's almost become the norm now, that there's so many coaches and yeah. programs out there that are producing Olympic, either Olympic champions or at least Olympic medalists, which is, mm. that's just so fantastic for British swimming. Wonderful to see. Um, but if you go back to 2012, that was that was not the norm. And um, we, you know, we struggled in London. Britain struggled in London as a nation, as we know. And it, and it got better in Rio and it got a lot better again in Tokyo. Um, so look, Plymouth produced an Olympic champion, um, and three world records came out of that program. I wouldn't know how many European and Commonwealth records came out of that program, but it was it was double figures. Um, and then Plymouth as a as a as a an entity, if you like, the Plymouth Leander and the Plymouth College connection 
Um, I think it set a great template for what could be achieved in uh, outside of a national centre programme, if you like, in, in Britain, um, just with a little bit of lateral thinking and a bit of creativity. Because it wasn't rocket science. You know, clubs spoke to a boarding school and said, shall we do something together? And the answer was yes. And then everything kind of evolved from there. Uh, and, and in a relatively short space of time, um, you know, the time from me being employed as a full-time coach in Plymouth to me leaving um, after Rio was only 10 years. And, and so in that period, you know, so much was achieved. You know, National Arena League title, I think, was won eight out of those 10 years. Um, and at the time I left, you know, we had just, just short of 30 different nationalities of international athletes moving to a relatively small town um, in the southwest of England to go to what had been um, a, a relatively unknown school outside of the southwest. And you only had to go back a little bit in time to a, to a club that was not even the best club in Devon, never mind one of the best clubs in Europe. So with, with, a, you know, with a, a little bit of um, enthusiasm and energy and... You know, some great partners had some great assistant coaches during that time. Very forward-thinking um, headmaster and deputy head at Plymouth College. Some great chairs at Plymouth Leander and a, and a, and a board at Plymouth Leander that basically said, we're going to be a club-led environment, uh, a, sorry, a coach-led environment. Tell us what you need because you're the professional. And, um, and then the Life Centre got built as well, which, you know, when you get a... Mm. 46 million pound 50 meter pool dropped on your doorstep that that helps useful so yeah. um <laughs> yeah so you know there was there was a lot of times the stars were aligned but there was there was a lot of creativity that almost made we created our own good luck that's the easiest mm. way to put it mm. Yeah. I mean, Ruta was a massive highlight, an amazing moment in your career, especially with her winning Olympic gold, like you say, and she was only 15 years old. And if I remember correctly, in those Olympics, it was her first major competition as well. How did you prepare her for that moment? Well, we didn't. We prepared her for trying to scrape into the final. Um, and, you know, she went into the Olympic Games ranked 10th in the world in the, in the 100 breast. She'd only just qualified because we had this ridiculous situation in 2011 where she did the Olympic qualification time at the European Youth Olympics. Um, but the European Youth Olympics apparently don't qualify you for the Olympics. They're not registered. So even though they're, even though they're organized by the same body, right, okay. they're not recognized as a qualification event. I should have read the paperwork a little bit closer, but you, know, <laughs> you would have thought that it would have, it would have qualified her, but it didn't. We had to go and scratch around a meet in France in January of 2012, um, untapered just to try and get the FINA air time. And um, she swam in the heats in, in a time that would suggest that she wasn't going to do it. And then in the final, found a bit of root and magic, as she often did, and, and did the, the qualification time. So went into Olympics in London, ranked 10th, and I would have been absolutely over the moon with 8th. You know, just to get through the rounds and, and to get into the final would have been a, a massively significant achievement. Um but the moment she saw the heat, and she almost broke the Olympic record, and there was a big hush around the stadium because it was like, who's this 15-year-old kid from Lithuania that's just made everybody look average? Mm. Um, I was, yeah, I, I, had, I had an element of shock just as much as everybody else did. And race plans and strategies um, went out the window. Um, and, you know, there was always the chance that that was going to fall apart between the heats and the semi-final, that, you know, there was going to be something wonderful and then, she was going to feel a bit of pressure and then she went faster again in the semi. And what made it even harder in the semi was I couldn't find anything wrong with the race. You know, in the heats, there was a couple of technical things to address. In the semi final, you know, it was like, hmm, uh, that's almost perfect. Uh, you know, what do you coach? Yeah. Um, so, and, and so when she went into the final rank first and she had Rebecca Sony next to her and there was Effie Mover in there and and Bridget Larson and all these girls that had, you know, been tearing the house down for a few years, it still seemed like, you know, this could be fourth or fifth and then you'd be disappointed, but you would come in here hoping that you'd, you'd get top eight. 
Um, and I remember thinking to myself after the semi, if there isn't a medal here, it's an opportunity lost. Um, and then I don't know if you recall, but the starting mechanism failed and everybody sat around for like 10 minutes waiting for them to repair the starting mechanism. Preja Larson dived in, got out, freezing wet, cold, panicky. Um, and so it was a, it was a, to say it was a roller coaster of emotions was, you know, it's like the understatement of the century. So there you have it. 15 year old kid goes and wins an Olympic medal. And it's the first time that Lithuania get to listen to their own national anthem at an Olympic Games. Because mm. before that, it was always the Russian national anthem under the USSR banner. Um, so it was, yeah, it was, it was huge. And it was, it was, do you know what I'll say to you? Because I often shoot myself in the foot with this, but. Like the day before we went to the Olympic Games, I was still as good a coach as I was the day that she won the gold. Mm. But, and I don't know how good that was, but I was that coach. You know, I was the same coach. Mm. And on that day, I was just like, I was just John that did X, Y, and Z in Plymouth and in England and whatever else, right? And then on the day that she won the gold medal, I was, in many people's eyes, I was escalated into this, you know, like one of the world's leading coaches. Mm. And and I was still the same guy that I was 72 hours before. And I often think there are some amazing coaches out there that are at least as talented as I am, if not, if not more so, but they don't necessarily have the good fortune of an athlete to come along and validate their abilities. And that's what Ruta did, was I always thought that I could coach and I always thought I had something and I was certainly better at coaching than I was at school teaching and I was certainly better at school teaching than I was at swimming. <laughs> um, but you need you need someone to come along and rubber stamp it and go, yeah, you are actually all right and I'll dive in and improve it. And I think that, you know, that's something that, that needs a bit of good fortune, but it also needs an athlete that really buys into what you, what you say and what you ask. Because yeah. she was absolutely, genuinely the first athlete that came along and said, whatever you say, whatever you tell me is right, I'll buy into 100% of it. The 24-7, 300 hour day thing. Not, not just going to the pool and do a good job or going to the gym and do a good job. But, you know, there's 19 hours outside of your sphere of influence when you're a coach. If you do two hours pool coaching in the morning and an afternoon and an hour in the gym, there's 19 hours left in a day. Well, that sits with the athlete. Mm. And so that was the piece of the education, I think, that not only we got right, but she mm. she absolutely grabbed it with both hands. And I, and I honestly believe it was those 19 hours a day that often athletes don't do because they're not being observed and they're not being measured by it. They don't necessarily think that it's going to make a difference. It was those hours that made a significant difference to who she was and what she achieved. Mm. And is there an advantage in it being a boarding school environment that that helps her 19 hours a day when she's away from the swimming team? The whole Plymouth College has its philosophy that drives the, the team as, as well as the team itself. Yeah, it, it does. It did help a lot of people, but it didn't help Ruta because she wasn't a boarder. She okay. actually lived on the outskirts of the school grounds with her father just in a really basic flat, uh, like a two-minute walk to the school gates. Her father moved from Lithuania to, to look after her, and they and they lived together. And um, so she wasn't a boarder. But I think that um, the father bought into it just as much as she did. And she would go back and say, John said, or, I'm, I'm, you know, the, re the program recommends I do X, Y, and Z, and he would just go, yeah, okay. And I don't know if that's an Eastern European thing mm -hmm. where there's just a, you know, I don't know if there's a little bit more acceptance and compliance in their culture. Um, but she was a blessing to coach because she just went, oh, right, okay, you've said it, so I'll do it. Uh, you Now you have to be careful when, you, when you've got that because um, you have to make sure you're getting it right because, you know, someone's totally relying on your, your every word. Mm -hmm. But um, now, if you take if you take other people, um, the boarding the boarding apps well, the boarding absolutely decided whether they were true to their word, mm -hmm. or it gave them enough scope to to um, to to deviate from that which they said they wanted to be, because when the, there's absolutely no doubt 
that your your own mother, your own mother and father uh, looking at you through a magnifying glass on a day to day basis um, means that you get away with a lot less than a boarding house master and a boarding house mistress watching over twenty or thirty of you. Mm. So if you're not true to your word and you don't deliver on that which you say you're going to do, i.e. the reason that you're, you've come there and your parents are going to invest in you in that way, um, then that, that, can, that can be uh, you know, not the best experience, particularly for a coach trying to manage that. Mm. But in the majority of cases, those that, that honoured their parents' belief and investment in them, because it ain't cheap to do something like that, mm -hmm. um, those guys flourished. And they flourished because they recognized that they might have a talented coach back at home, uh, but their swimming program might be the thing that was holding them back. No matter how talented the coach is, if they don't have enough hours, they don't have a S&C program, they don't have a 50-meter pool, they've got too many athletes per lane, their sessions are at a terrible time of the day, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't matter how great that coach is um, because they don't have the resources around them to deliver what it is that that athlete maybe needs. And that's what that's what Plymouth and now other programs um, in Great Britain can offer. It it removes that geographic disadvantage away from the athlete. Mm. I feel like a lot of coaches would dream to have a summer that successful so young. What sort of challenges did it present with her being a world leader while still effectively being an age grouper? Did you have to hold her back at any stage? Um. She she dealt with it really really well. I mean, you know, she she won the Olympic Games and then and then went and won her first European Junior title, um, and uh, and the swam the first World Junior Championships and so on. What what the what being a junior still at that time allowed her to do was do stuff other than breaststroke, because she was absolutely a great freestyler, and um, and and certainly could swim a decent medley. I think. At the European short course in 2018, um, she swam the second fastest 100 IM of all time. You know, there was only the world record that, that was faster than she swam on a 100 IM. And she couldn't swim butterfly or backstroke, really. It was kind of okay. She got away with great underwater speed. And, um, and that allowed her to swim 57.4 or whatever it was at that time on the 100 IM. So... Um, but she swam like well juniors. I think she got bronze in the 50 back and it, it wasn't a pretty backstroke. Um, but, but what the junior swimming for the next year or two allowed her to do was just not be a breaststroker. Mm. Um, now when we went to the senior meets, obviously that's what she really focused in on. Um, and she had an advantage over, over many breaststrokers of being able to swim the primary training stroke well without fear of injury or not being able to keep up with a lane. You know, freestyle was extremely decent. Mm. Um, so, the, but she then very quickly after that, within a year, was desperate for the junior years to finish. Um, I remember going to the, the World Youth Olympics in China um, and she just kind of got mobbed by young kids. Mm -hmm. And I say young kids, they were her age, mm. but her maturity was so far beyond the age of everybody else at the meet that she almost looked at them like, you know, they were three, four years younger than her when actually some of them were the same age as her. Mm. And so when the junior years finished, I think she was, she was quite pleased, but it didn't allow that latitude so much of, well, let's do some other stuff that, that you enjoy and you can still get through the rounds and you can still challenge for medals and they're they're less pressured environments if you like you know if you do a world junior final in the 50 back no one's expecting another world record or for you to do something scintillating and if you do that's great um so it was a it was a yin and a yang that period i suppose it's almost that message that we've had on here. We've had it so many times with coaches before about avoiding plateau by not specializing down. Yes, she was the world record holder at the 100 breaststroke, and that was what she was going to be. But by freeing her up mentally and racing these other races, it, it almost, I don't know, pr not, why am I Reduces pressure? Yeah, reduces pressure for uh, for what was a really hard period as a junior. Yeah, and it's why um, if parents and young swimmers advise me now, you know, whether whether we should 
partake in other sports other than swimming mm. at age group level? My answer is, um, on the balance of things, yes. Mm. Because although it might take up some time and although it might, might make you a bit more fatigued and although you risk injury, as long as you avoid maybe the contact sports where the injury risk is higher, you can enjoy the world of sport without feeling that there's someone observing you all the time or there's a, there's a guy with a notepad and a pen or someone in the corner with a camera. Or, mm. and, and I think that, that that's absolutely the case here as well within the sport, if you look at it intrinsically rather than extrinsically, that um, keep a breadth and balance to your program as long as you can. Mm. And don't be afraid to go to some meets and not swim your number one events. Mm. You know, it's it's not a problem. It's it's only if if the outcome of that one meet is important, then you would do that. But if the outcome of that one meet is to prepare you for another meet or a or a swimming career, then it's not a problem to go to county championships or regional championships and not swim your, your best events. Particularly if you're gonna if you're gonna win the hundred freestyle by twelve or thirteen meters, I don't know really what that what that achieves. If you've got a higher performing athlete representing their club in a in a county championships, that's great. That should that should absolutely happen because that's about aspiring another generation. Mm. It's about representing your club with honor uh, and as a thank you to your club as well for what they've done for you. Um, but. Um, a, a high performing athlete swimming a county championship should be using it as a bridge into a regionals and a regionals into a nationals and a nationals into representing their country. They're, they're on a continuum. So, you know, if you're, if you're amazing at the, at the, at the 200 backstroke, don't be afraid to go to the county championships and not swim the 200 backstroke. If there's something that you can get out of your comfort zone in another area, um, go and experience defeat. You, you, you learn an awful lot from it. Um, and and take and take the knockbacks on the chin and dust yourself off and come back the following day and race another event that isn't your natural bread and butter and have a go again. So whether whether medal and the outcome really mean something, yes. Where it's part of a process, maybe not. Now that's not me deriding a county medal or a regional medal because for hundreds of athletes out there, a county medal is an amazing achievement. And it is an amazing achievement. Um, but if you rank third in the nation um, or sixth in Europe, maybe winning your county championships isn't such mm. a big deal. Mm. Um, and you've, you've got to accept that of, wh of where you sit in swimming as a sport at that time. So um, don't be afraid, if, if necessary, in consultation with your coach to, to leave your premier events behind and learn something from getting second, third or fourth. I think it's really, really powerful really, message. Yeah, really, really good advice. Actually, do you have any other advice for coaches who are currently experiencing success like you did or still are? Yeah, enjoy it because it doesn't last forever. Um, mm. there's, there's, there's no doubt that, um, you know, when you're in a purple patch and you're, having your, and you're having your moment or your moments, unless you're in a fortunate position... Uh, to be working in a in a national centre within your country where there's just a conveyor belt of great athletes being handed to you on a on an annual basis. If you and there's you know at the end of the day in um, in Britain there's there's between four and six of those guys and we have a similar number in Ireland. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of coaches are working in different environments. So if you're working in one of those other environments, enjoy it. Um, be humble and gracious. Um, for, for the good times, prepare yourself for maybe a, maybe a bit of a bump back to earth because you don't know the day when that athlete says I'm retiring or I'm going to go and swim somewhere else. Um, and you just need to be able to, like an athlete having a, a, a tough time, you've got to be able to take that on the chin and then you have to rebuild. And I, you know, so the, some of the coaches that I absolutely hugely admire uh, maybe maybe outside of swimming would be those coaches that, that achieve the top of their game and then seem to be able to come back the next year or the next season 
and are equally hungry to do it again, even when they've already done it. Mm. You know, Alex Ferguson would be a would be a tremendous example of that. You know, he was as hungry for his sixth or seventh FA Cup title as he was for his first, um, or his you know however many Premiership uh, titles he won. And then I'll go and do it again. And then I'll go and do it again. Um, and I think as, as swimming coaches, we've got to have that, that resilience. And, um, and resilience ultimately develops into a concept of hardiness where you, you become thick-skinned and broad-shouldered. And um, you, could, you, you, take the, you take the good times as magnanimously as you take the tough times. Because, you know, I can, I can think of quite a few British swimming coaches that have been absolutely at the top of the game and then have had some fallow years where they've maybe struggled a little bit, finding, finding their feet or changing programs, whatever else. But I can, I can tell you, the, you know, I'm not going to name them, but I can tell you the ones that didn't change their personalities or character because of that, they are the great people. That regardless of what's going on around them, um, they were they were the same person even when the tough times were there and then quite often they'd come again somebody else would walk through the door or they'd get a new opportunity and 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 they'd have a second wind so um yeah if you've got if you've got success now um there's there's a good chance that at some stage it'll it'll either dwindle or go and then you've got then you've got to have plan b in your back pocket about what you do to go looking for either that again in the same environment, uh, that again in the same sport, that again in the same role, um, or how you're going to change your life to continue with the same kind of job satisfaction that you that you had at that time. Mm. Should we talk about your change then? Because you went from success at Leander and you've decided to move on to Swim Ireland. What made that change come about? Well, it's a, it's a great leading from the last point because it, it was absolutely the first time in my life after Rio that I thought I I need to do something different here because I've I've done this I've done this in the same place uh, for twenty seven years and that's a long time um, and I could you know did I want to carry on coaching Yes I I I, I did. And I, and I love coaching, and I'd and I'd go back to it tomorrow if the right um, opportunity came along. Um, no, I wouldn't because I actually love what I'm doing now. So you know, you know what I mean. It, but yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it's not that I fell out of love with coaching. It it's um, it was. Do you do you want to try and do you want to try and do everything that you set out to do again? So, you know, when I, when I wanted coaching and someone said to me, what, what do you want to achieve? I said, well, I'd like Plymouth the answer to, to be the best club in, in Britain. And um, I'd like to coach an Olympic champion and I'd like to coach a world record. And you, and you say all three of those almost like, well, that means I can do it forever because none of, you know, um, one of those will happen if you're lucky. And the, the chances of all three happening is, is slim to nil. And then all three happened. And after Rio... Um, and and partic- you know, it was Rio was weird because because Ruta was was struggling, um, and, but Ben Proud had come on the scene, and you know, there was there was part of me that was like, Ruta's still an unfinished project. If she wants to keep going, I think we can get. I think we can turn this round. And my goodness, Ben Proud, mm. this guy's a rocket, and we've only just started to scratch the surface with him. Um, but I, I, you know, I had that sort of honest conversation in the mirror, which was, um, are, you as, are you as hungry to keep doing this job as you always were? And if I was honest, I was just a little bit less hungry. And then when I asked myself the question, so if swimming's your passion and swimming's your love, what is it you want to do? And the answer was, help people experience that which I experienced. Um, because... You know, no one will ever take those feelings away from me, and and um, I can't believe that that London's ten years this this year. It's crazy. It still feels like yesterday. Yeah. And when when something that monumental is part of your life, um, but replicating it doesn't drive you, then 
my answer was then find a way for somebody else to experience that and you just be able to sit back and go i helped them and that's why a performance director's job when it came along in an english-speaking nation because i am limited with the fact that i can only speak one language uh, came along i was like right there's there's your chance go and create a culture go and strategize go and go and, go and help a nation to to um try and achieve that that you've already achieved and and I, I still sincerely hope that one day there's a coach working in ireland um that experiences that that i experienced in london and i'll be able to just smile and go yeah that was that was what i came here for yeah i mean we've noticed and i'm sure many of us have noticed also uh, a lot of progress mm -hmm. in ireland in recent years how is it going over there what changes have you made since your arrival Oh, goodness me. Now, the changes, um, you know, I could hand you over in a in a telephone directory of, of, of changes, some of them small and some of them and some of them quite big. Um, you know, I, I think I think the first thing is that we we reestablished what the national centre programmes were. There was a national centre in Dublin and a national centre in Limerick. I would suggest that they look different now to what they did in 2017. And then this, um, these last few months, we've also added a third centre in Northern Ireland. And um, for those people who don't understand um, Ireland or, or Irishness as much as I do now, there's the island of Ireland, which is the geography of the whole thing. Mm. But it's actually two nations. There's the Republic of Ireland, which is, which is the, the holder and the owner, if you like, of the Irish flag and the Irish national anthem. And then, of course, Northern Ireland that would that would be part of the UK, but in most sports would fall under the banner of an All Ireland team, as with the rugby team when the Six mm. Nations run out in a few weeks' time. Mm. And swimming's in that boat now. Anybody in Northern Ireland can represent Great Britain if they wish, but their default is to represent Ireland. And so we have this really unique situation. It's not, yeah, quite unique where. You know, we have euros one side of the border and pounds sterling the other. Uh, the signposts south of the border are written in miles and north, uh, sorry, in kilometres and north of the border are written in miles. Um, you know, it's it, it, it quite literally is like um, two nations that, that, that have been meshed together under one banner of Ireland, but it works. Mm. And all four provinces that make up all Ireland um, believe in representing Ireland and the Irish feeling. Um, and it took me quite a while to understand that as an Englishman. Um, so we, but we, we thought that it was, it was right and respectful to put a centre in Northern Ireland because it has got its own geography and its own culture and, it's, and a lot of people consider that to be home and, and the Republic of Ireland not to be home. But that, it's a bit like a Scottish swimmer wanting to swim in England or an English swimmer wanting to swim in Wales. Mm. They, they feel that it's Great Britain, but they know where home is. Mm. And so we, 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 did, we did that for that, for that, uh, that feeling. And now um, the majority of our identified athletes are in those three centres. There's a couple in the UK and a couple in the States also doing well. And, um, and, so, and we changed the competition plan domestically so that all four regions kind of did the same thing at the same time for the same reasons and called them the same names. Um, and I think when I, when I arrived, the performance team was, I think it was three staff, maybe four, and it's now 20 with a whole host of, um, contractual staff working across two, um, sporting institutes, again, one in the South, one in the North. Um, it, it, it looks and feels different. Um, we didn't, we didn't throw everything out because there was some good stuff going on and, um, and there was, there, there was things there that we said, right, well, if, if we just polish that a bit, it will be even better. And then there was things that we, that we quite literally started from scratch. And that blend of um, bringing in new and bettering the old, um, that's, that's helped us move forward. So now, we're not where we want to be. You know, we're still, we've still got some, some way to go. And we're always going to have the challenge of being six million people across the whole island. Um, which is not a huge populace in which to progress one sport. And it's a vast geography and extremely rural. Mm. So if you live outside of Dublin, Cork, Galway or Belfast, you've got challenges. Because mm. um, finding a good coach, 
and a pool in the middle of you know a rural town or a village is is tough but we're we're, we're certainly making we're certainly making good progress and I would say that we're punching above our weight and mm. um, and we've still got places to go that, that you should see it get better still mm. yeah definitely definitely moving I'd say really fast in the right direction short mm. course world championships we got the stats here it was eight, 18 Irish senior records seven finals two medals you got swimmers coming through like Shane Ryan Danielle Hill Daniel Whiffin Ellen Walsh it, it there's, they are now names on the international scene, whereas before I've been following swimming for a while, I'm not sure I could have named an Irish swimmer right at the top. And these guys are pushing, a, well, getting close to Olympic finals now. Getting medals, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, and it's great. Look, we've all got to keep our feet on the ground because it was a short course world championships. Um, and, you know, we, we now we now to see how those athletes... Um, convert that into uh, into this into this long course season um but you know you, you can only beat the people that turn up um and you can uh, it, it it doesn't matter it doesn't matter whether it's a 25 meter pool or a 50 meter pool or world championships is a world championships and if you're taking on the best in the world and you can stand up and you can deliver in the moment that matters um which is kind of been our mantra for the last five years don't mind what you do here, here, and here. But if we've identified that as the moment that matters, that's when you need to stand up, perform. And a week before and a week after, that doesn't that doesn't sort of ring the bell. And that's that's the kind of stuff that we've now that we've now started to see. And um, hey, I'll, I'll go back to one of the comments that I made about Plymouth. Um, I have a great team of people working working with me on this. And one of the reasons that it's been successful is. A, a number of coaches and sports science practitioners and and others put their faith in me as an individual to to lead something different and really took a risk, took a bit of a punt to come out of environments that were already good um, to see if this could be something special. And I hope now um, I and the athletes are starting to reward them a little bit for for showing showing them uh, sh- them showing faith in in something that was relatively unfounded at the time now you would say four or five years in um you know ireland's more less of a risk or more it is less of a chance yeah. of of whether or not we can have some success there as a as a professional you know the when we recently advertised for the national uh, center head coach's job in in ulster um the number of applications was it was almost too many to go through so it, if people are noticing it, um, then that's helpful because it means when you've got an opportunity in your ranks, the quality of the applicant wanting to work with you is even higher, even higher, because it was, it was high before. Mm-hmm. You had Ben Hickba. You had Ben Hidkson as part of your team in Ireland who's recently just moved or moving to Australia. How much of a loss is he going to be? Yeah, he's going to be a big loss. He's Ben. He's, he's, a, he's a great lad and he's a great coach. And, um, you know, he, I think he came in September, 2017. So it was about nine months after I started. Um, and he's been, he's been a huge positive influence on all sorts of, of sections in Swim Island. And, and yes, most noticeably in the performance team, he's, he's led one of the centers. He's been the national head coach, um, you know, he's been my default go-to person with ideas um, for for all of that time, and in, and in fact, um, you know, there's a lot of the stuff that we do originated out of his head. So he's he's certainly going to be he's certainly going to be missed. Um, but I, you know, no one can blame him for looking at the opportunity that's been offered to him. Mm. Um, it's a it's a it's a wonderful opportunity out there in Australia and a fantastic place to to live and he's got a young family so um, you know we absolutely um, thank him and uh, graciously accept that he's made this decision there's there's no well there never is any bad feeling when people move on eh because you've been you've been part of you've been part of the process that helped that's helped them to apply for such a position yeah. so yeah. you know you would you would all feel um you would all feel good good for the lad um and <clears throat> but i always say with these kind of things you know 
what might look like a problem is an opportunity in disguise. And we're still 30 months away from an Olympic Games. And people keep saying it's it's around the corner, and it is, but it isn't. Mm. And so this um, this gives us a chance to to sit back, look at look at um, what resource we have, you know, who's in the mix, um, what opportunities there might be for for people outside of the Swim Island community at this stage, um, from those within Ireland, from within our own team, and. Um, Although we'll miss him, uh, we're we're not going to let it thwart us in our progress. You know, we'll be we'll be as good as ever, as Ireland would be if I left or anybody else. You know, it's it's now strong enough to be way more than does does one person walk through walk out the door cause a problem. That's that's not the case anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I, th- I think the everything you've described to us about swim island is that mantra of success breeds success and it's just a snowball effect at this point i think i'm really excited to see what comes in the next slightly shortened cycle but it is still three years two years now isn't it two and a half yeah yeah um dan's got one final question that he's really interested in what's about your personal coaching um you're a doctor of psychology has that helped you in your ability to coach swimmers no, not at all, Dan. If I'm honest with you, um, I don't. I don't know that it changed anything at all. I mean, I was an am- I've been an amateur psychologist forever, and I just finally decided to get a ticket that that went alongside that. Um, so, I think I think more. What's been more important than that is my life as a school teacher um, to help me with my coaching, because the way that I think the way that I that I manage people and lead people, the leadership style that I have has been crafted in the world of education and less and less so in the world of swimming. Um, the, the and the notion that you are trying to positively affect thousands of young people on a daily basis. Um, again, I don't know if coaches ever sit back and think about that, but that certainly is is where. The, the good headmasters and principals that I work for very much bang that drum on a daily basis. You know, you choose to be a positive influence on these young people or you choose to not be or be indifferent and just pick up your wage and walk away. And that had a massive impact on me and I've, and I've carried that into my coaching ever since. Um, so if I were to say, you know, if you were to change your question slightly to where where are your out, uh, external experience and education um, pieces to your life that have influenced your coaching the most? I, I wouldn't have said that that doing a, a doctorate in psychology was at the top of the list. I would absolutely say it's. I did you know I did fifteen years of trying to school teach and trying to be a swimming coach, and burning the candle at both ends to try and do each as well as I as I could before I decided to go down one particular route. That that certainly prepared me more than than any qualification ever did, it's, and um, and I think that some of the coaches that have come out of the world of business, or the world of commerce, um, bring bring other things to the table as well. And if and if ever, if people's life have literally been, I was an athlete and now I'm a swimming coach, and that's that's kind of it, then then they've missed a trick. And there's there's other things out there that they should try and blend. And craft into their professional practice to to be the best the, be, the best that they can be in terms of their coaching. Mm-hmm. Kind of similar to cross sports, isn't it? As an athlete doing tennis yeah. or something like you know, same thing with coaching. It's very similar. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And it's why it's why the um, it's why senior athletes and professional athletes need to ensure that they keep keep their hand in education and not just assume that their sport's gonna gonna deliver for them for the rest of their lives. Because although it may very well do. Um, there's there's a richness and a fullness that can be brought to your delivery and your style as a coach um, that comes from outside of the world of swimming. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, for people out there who are considering, you know, what's the next stage of my professional development? Well, don't go on a backstroke CPD or a freestyle turn CPD. Find... Find something that's going to allow you to be a, 
better person in the way that you deliver. Because I honestly believe that great coaching is not the content, it's the delivery. The content's part of it, but it's selling the dream and it's delivering the message. And, you know, that there could be five coaches that all write the same set and deliver it to the same athletes. There's always going to be one coach that gets more out of those athletes than the other four. So if the set's the same, what was it? And the answer is it's them. So how do you become a better them? How, how, how are you going to get to the top of your game? And, and it isn't necessarily learning how to put your hand in better on freestyle or how your hips should rotate on backstroke. It's more than that. Mm. Another powerful message. And I, I think that's a really good one to sort of wind this podcast to a close. John, it's been an inspiring podcast, honestly. It's been really inspirational speaking to you. Um, we usually finish with some quick fire questions with our guests. We've got a coach's edition. Does that sound good to you? Yeah, okay. This is probably where I'm at my weakest. I'll th- I'll want to think about them too much, but let's give it a go. Um, what's your favorite stroke to coach? Breaststroke. Uh, who is your swimming idol? And it could be a coach. Swimming idol. Wow. I would say Laurie Dormer, the former coach of Bournemouth Dolphins, because he gave me an opportunity to coach at a higher level than club swimming that nobody else gave me. What is the proudest moment in your swimming journey so far? So I'm going to split it between coaching an Olympic gold medal and having three of my four kids really gain something from the sport, but not necessarily coached by me. Like it. Um, What's the hardest set you've ever given out in training? Hmm. Right. So I'll give you two. Um, (laughs) Ben, ben Proud, uh, four, 4.25s max of 20 minutes. Ooh, right, that that's works. really tough. I like that. Um, Cassandra Patton, 60.50s freestyle, holding 32 seconds, going off 40. Blimey. Completely different spectrums, but yeah. equally. There you go. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if you were to go on a road trip, there's three spaces in the car. Who would you take with you? They can be friends, family, or celebrities. Okay, so I'd I'd absolutely take Tommy Cooper. Um, I'd take Jeffrey Boycott. Um, and then I would take Brian Clough. Oh, yeah, nice ones. Nice. Yeah. Um. John, thank you so much for coming on to this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. It's it, honestly, I hope everyone listening gains as much from this podcast as I know me and Dan have gained. Yeah, it's actually really inspirational, like you said earlier, and I've learned quite a lot, to be honest with you. Um, I just really hope that Swim Ireland continues on the path that it's on at the moment. I, I, I generally think there's good things to come, and I do think Olympic medals are on the way. So watch the space. Thank you, gents. That just about rounds up this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. Dan, I will see you in seven days' time. Yes, thank you very much for listening, everyone, and we'll catch you on the next one. You've been listening to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast with Scott and Dan. We want to thank you for joining us and invite you to subscribe to the show as well as checking out the Propulsion Swimming YouTube channel for weekly tutorials and videos to get your swimming fix. We will be back next week. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one.